Hi, I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast. And today we're going to get a little bit, mm, I suppose, political, no, not political, but we're talking about sovereign citizen citizenship, if I can say the word, uh, and kind of, kind of an extreme form of libertarianism. So I, I guess it's political. So I know there are people who don't always love us talking politics and don't love us talking about these types of topics. And honestly, I understand, but you don't need to watch this. It's not required. You don't, you don't have to. We just want to have a good conversation. We want to talk about things that maybe somebody or people sit around the table wondering, is this a good idea? Is it a good idea to, to try to go away from the government and go off the grid and, and not pay taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? These are things I think do come up in, a, in an everyday conversation. And so we want to talk about that. We want to have on people who know a little bit about it. And Matthew Arthur is my at least semi expert on the matter. He has he has experience in law. He has experience in this exact um, scenario. Um, I do want to say we're both not moral experts. We we don't have any judgment in terms of morality or faith. If you have any questions regarding what's right and wrong, talk to your priest, not to me and Matt. But these these are our opinions, and Matt does have experience in this matter. So Matt, I'm going to send it straight to you. Maybe you can give a brief introduction of yourself and the topic. Thanks very much, Kevin. Excited to be here again. Uh, so I'm a traditional Catholic. I'm a father of three kids. A bit onto what's really relevant for this show. So I do have an Australian law degree, but I'm not a practicing lawyer. And to be a practicing lawyer, you do have to take more steps. So I want to make that super clear. What I do is I do work in the compliance field for an energy company. And part of my role is actually managing communications from sovereign citizens or people who send in material that's sovereign citizen like um and what what i think that's one of the reasons i wanted to do this show is i thought there might not be a lot of people who've actually had first-hand experience i want to make something really clear just like you said the disclaimer about moral advice uh i wouldn't have been a good law student if i wouldn't do my own disclaimer so this this show yeah i'm not giving any legal advice of course but this is just a bit about me but at the end of the day i'm just a guy providing some commentary on this topic um a bit on i guess why i'm doing this so like I said, I do have that personal experience or professional experience that a lot of people might not have had. And that's also forced me to do a bit of my own research on stuff um, and then the law degree and all that understanding some legal principles helps. Why else? So I find this movement can be can potentially be appealing to traditional Catholics or conservative people. And I think that's because we in Western society are ruled by left wing uh, left wing governments that are Basically, they operate, they're founded on and operate on non-Catholic principles. And when I, just to confirm, when I say non-Catholic, I basically mean principles that are like against the principles of Catholicism. Like they're kind of the opposite. They're just not compatible. Um, so that's what I mean when I say that throughout this show. One thing as well, to be a bit topical, I know we're sick of hearing about COVID, but with COVID restrictions by our governments, where governments have tried to really ramp up the, I guess, uh, power that they enforce, um, you know, trying to control more things of our lives, what we can and can't do. I think this movement is potentially on the rise because when something happens extreme, there's always going to be an extreme reaction. Um, and one thing that I think is really bad about this um, is that people who might be in an unfortunate circumstance, so let's say they've lost their job or because of COVID restrictions, which it's, it's some, affected someone bad, potentially... And when they're in that kind of state, you, this, you might be attracted to this kind of thing um, because it can sound attractive, but it could, if you fall for it and you get sucked in, it can make your life a heck of a lot worse. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's really important to raise awareness for this, for that aspect. Um, in final, I guess, for why... Yeah, I think the lies that this movement pushes can be very harmful materially to people, but also the mentality it fosters is just not healthy and it's really not compatible with Catholicism, uh, in my opinion. Final thing I'll say on the motivation is that sovereign citizen stuff, you've got a whole spectrum. So you've got people who are like crazy, man, you know, like a traditional Catholic who's going to see that's going, you're crazy. But what you can get, I'm thinking like memes or documents or YouTubes and things like this on the internet that kind of put things forward as truth, but they don't seem as outrageous. Like if you don't understand your legal principles and you don't really understand how that world works, you don't have any practical experience you might sort of think, hey, there's something to that. That makes sense. And that's where it can also be a little bit dangerous. Probably not as much because you're not going to get too sucked in. Like you're probably going to still live normally. But I think it's really good if, that we can understand, hey, this material and what they're pushing is actually, well, incorrect and 
non-Catholic. So that that's my spiel. I hope uh, I hope I hope people are as excited for this topic as I am. We're going to get a bit into the detail as well, so uh, but not too much, of course. And I and I think that it's it's a really it's a really important topic. And it's one that we covered in a in a sort of way in a, in a podcast a couple months ago with Eric um, talking about yeah nationalism and patriotism and, and the necessity of of obeying a government and, and i think we're gonna get kind of into detail about that and i'll let you do that um and i think that that as you say it's it's really important because it's a it's a really dangerous mentality of of falling into do we really have to listen to the government i mean especially in america i think because america was was literally founded on rebellion right they, they were founded by overthrowing a government now legitimate or not i guess you can delve into that in another show, but I think that the mentality is, oh, if we don't like it, we can just overthrow it. It's, it's, an, iffy, it's an iffy scenario, and I think that, again, that's kind of what we want to cover today, that you got to be really careful with this. And legally, so again, if you try to do this, what might come from that, right, and what might affect you in a negative way? So, so I'd say let, let's, let's uh, let it roll. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. I'll, I'll talk a bit, I guess, why sovereign citizens exist. Now, obviously, I'm not going to judge everyone's motives, but I'm going to look at what they try to do. Why, what are they trying to achieve? So I've got some bullet points here of what I've found. They want to achieve, they want to avoid paying tax, avoid paying utility bills, avoid paying bank loan payments. And I want to make it clear, someone might be a sovereign citizen who only does one of these things. Sovereign citizens, I was telling Kevin, they... Uh, Kevin about this before the show they, they kind of remind me of Protestants because they all have their own little thing they have their own little interpretations and their own way of going about things I haven't seen uniformity even when in my in my in the business that I work in when I see communications every single one has a different different sort of uh, a different methodology sometimes maybe someone who's just trying it out might use something that's like a template so you might see some similarities but the ones who are really really sticking to their guns they they, they all seem to have their own spin what else do they try to do they avoid paying for driver's license and vehicle registration and avoid paying fines such as speeding fines toll toll fines um, and one thing I find really interesting as well is they try to, and I know this from personal experience, is they, unilat they try to unilaterally impose conditions upon companies and I believe government bodies as well. By unilaterally, uh, what I mean is imposing a condition without the other person accepting it. So, for instance, Kevin, I'm, I might say, hey, uh, you, you, can you mow my lawn? And you say, yep, do it 50 bucks, no worries. Now, you go and then do my lawn and you go, hey, I can do some, I don't know, I can do some extra gardening here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that extra gardening. And for that extra 10 minutes of gardening, I'm going to slap on an extra $10,000. Well, not legal advice here, but based on my understanding, no. Because for a contract to exist, we need to, we need to have previously agreed upon it. So you need to have said to me, hey, Matt, I will do your gardening. And this is the price I will do it. And then I will have to say yes or I'll have to say no. And if I, and you can't, you can't just say, you can't just unilaterally do it, doing it without the other party consenting. Now, now, does that work from the other side too? I mean, because the government say taxes us just whatever they feel like taxing, right? So is that, it's, it's, I guess tax is not a contract necessarily. I guess that's more of a enforced yeah, payment in order to, to help society exist, I suppose. But, but I understand from the tax perspective, why people have a problem with it. I, I do. And people have had problems with tax for thousands of years. And, and, you know, the morality of it, I guess, depends on how much the percentage, what they're taxing. And I think that we both agree that in some forms, tax can be slavery. But does that mean that just because you don't like it, because maybe you do feel it to be immoral, can you just not pay it? And again, I know these are things we're going to talk about, but it just comes to my mind that it, the contract on that side is only one-sided too. Great question. Contracts are different to government laws. So contracts are civil, right? So it's between you and me. Um, but government, that's a separate thats a separate world. There's, so you can have a civil court where it's, Kevin, you have a dispute with me. Now, if you're being tried by the government, you're now in criminal law, totally separate. So it's a really good point you bring up and people probably, uh, and it's good if you keep bringing these up because people might not know this. I might just take it for granted and I don't get to explain it, but they're separate. You've got civil, you've got criminal, you've got government saying, so tax isn't a contract. It's basically government saying, hey, you got to pay us this according to our methodology, and it is it is legally enforceable uh, by by the governments, and legitimately so, uh, is my understanding. Um, so great point there. Now some examples. Uh, I'm going to hand them to you, Kevin, to put in your show notes. 
Um, I'm going to put just links to some things you might see via Sovereign Citizen. So I guess for those viewing, maybe pause this, have a look at the show notes. I'm going to put the hyperlinks there. No, I'm not going to bother explaining them because there's no point where you can just click on the thing. Um, and if you're listening, I guess while you're in the car and stuff, you can check it later. But it, it's, it's pretty good to see an example of what these people do because the more examples you see, when you see those other things, you're going to start thinking, hey, is this Sovereign Citizen stuff behind this? Now, I want to get into, speaking of that, how can we see some indicators, examples of buzz, buzzwords or even uh, activity you may expect to see that come from the, I'm going to call them SovSit, the SovSit movement, um, like a short everything here in Australia, but I think they do it in America, actually, SovSit. Um, now, these can actually include normal terms, but applied in an ineffective context. So I'm just going to rattle off a few. Freeman of the land, very common. Common law court. Uh, and I'm going to get into this phrase common law court because you might hear it. This And this, when I think of common law court, I think of actually these things that people might fall for because it doesn't sound as outrageous, you know. And if you get tried by this, you know, a speeding fine, whatever, you have to ask for a common law court. And I am really excited to get into this because there is a – I'm not going to make any spoilers, but I've got something interesting for you. Um, all rights reserved out of context. So I remember watching a video of some guy. This was actually someone uh, – you know, I received this from um, a customer I was dealing with. So he sent this video uh, on YouTube. And this guy's like, now if I – what I do is on this government piece of paper, can't remember what it was, I write all rights reserved and that protects me, please. Um, living soul is another thing, like sign off in living soul, wet ink signature, or oh, your, your contract's not valid because you didn't use a wet ink signature. That's the kind of context you might see that. You might see the use of red ink on documents, um, including a thumbprint in red ink. So if, if you see, if you see a, a document online, a template or whatever, or, or anything they say about you know, using red ink with the thumbprint, there's a very good chance it's a sovereign citizen thing, so that's a good indicator. What else do we see? Quoting the Bible in a legal context for to form their legal argument. And I'll get into that. Quoting things like the Magna Carta, a bit, a bit outdated. Oh, I mean, I'm not an English lawyer, um, but, you know, I think it's a bit outdated, my understanding, but it's the concept of going back to really outdated things where there's probably more recent legislation that's come in that actually is governing you in that area. Um, we'll see quoting legal authority from multiple jurisdictions. Now, when I say jurisdictions, I mean area, so like a various country. So an example you might see, right, is um, let's say if I'm a sovereign citizen, I might say to my, I don't know, the Australian tax office, hey, you can't do this because the American constitution says this. Well, it's the American constitution. It's not Australia. It doesn't govern Australia, so nice try. Um, and one thing as well, the last one I'll touch on is using odd punctuation in an attempt to make themselves immune from government authority or even like their contractual obligations. Um, the common one is using an unconventional way of presenting your name. So, for instance, I am Kevin Davis. You might sign off as Kevin Davis and you might chuck a column at the end of Davis because then it's not Kevin Davis. I don't know what goes through their mind. Um, and sometimes they will argue weird things like, hey, your bill has my name fully capitalised, but my name's not fully capitalised, so I don't need to pay it. So so, so these are some of the indicators. Um, and I wanted to really... I, I looked up the meaning of sovereignty just, just to, you know, bolster this. Sovereign citizen. It's sovereign citizen. So sovereignty is the supreme legitimate authority within a territory. And if one is sovereign... One possesses or is held to possess supreme political power or sovereignty. So, again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say what exactly goes through all of their minds. I'm not gonna do stereotypes. But let's think about this. If, if one is a sovereign citizen, I would think that. Oh, oh I should say, Kevin, I've I've I've, I've explained that um, definition to you. If I say to you now, I'm a sovereign citizen. What do you think? What do you guess? I think I, I'm ultimately believing or saying there. What what sort of goes through your mind? Ooh, now knowing the definition, yeah, I think that you consider yourself to be the supreme lawful authority for for everything you do, right? Uh, that's that's yeah, pretty heavy. A, a bit of spec, yeah, a bit of speculation there because I just looked up the definition, but it actually covers it really, really, really well. Um, before I move on, Kevin, I've got some more to get onto, obviously, or a lot more. But did you have anything you wanted to add at this point? Yeah, it's, it's it's a good question. It, it is a lot of stuff, and I think it's it's kind of a like like the the one that really gets me is the using odd punctuation. Uh, I think that that's pretty funny. As my phone rings, sorry about that. Um, the, the the odd punctuation, I think, is kind of funny that it's like just trying to find any way possible just to, to not have to pay a, a bill. <laughs> I think that's 
I think that's a little childish. I, I mean, in the end, obviously, it just comes down to do I think I have to pay this or not? And then you're just trying to find any possible way of not paying it. And if that means punctuation or something, I mean, I guess I, I don't know. It just sounds it sounds like a, like a half hearted attempt at, at trying to work your way around things that are uncomfortable. And taxes and fines are uncomfortable. I understand. I, I paid a 20 euro parking ticket the other day, even though, yeah, it's a long story, but, but I had to pay it. I got it. I disagreed with it, but, but it was like, okay, yeah. I mean, I guess I was parked in a place that I should have, I should have paid the two bucks. And so I got to pay 20 euros. Do I think 20 euros is, is a fair amount? Absolutely not. I think that's absolutely crazy. And I think, I think in, in, in Australia, it may be, even be crazier, but, but you do what you got to do. You, you, you pay the fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, um, personal experience, a speeding fine in Australia for like the, I think, lowest, like you can really get caught. I think it was the lowest. You're looking at like 220 bucks. So um, oh. Australia loves their socialism and fines. Um, all right. So, uh, but it's legitimate authority. They can do what they want, even if we don't agree with it. Uh, <laughs> but you can, I'll, I'll get into this as well. You can actually um, have legitimate means of dispute, even if you are technically guilty. Um, so, and I think it's something we can talk about. I'll talk about a bit later because it's comforting to know if you sort of know these other avenues, you might not resort to such absurdity as a sovereign citizen movement. So I might move on to a bit of background on the movement. Now I found when I was doing some research, extra research for this show, I found a great explanation on a YouTube video, which was just synced up. So they describe sovereign, sovereign citizens or soft sits as individuals who believe the law is illegitimate and answer only to their own interpretation of the law. That's just, I just thought that was brilliant. Um, so that pretty much sums it up. Um, there's a lot of resources you can read online. I was going to read from this, this uh, quick guide on sovereign citizens that I found online. Kevin, what I might just do is I'll let you chuck it in the show notes and then people can basically read it in their own time if they wish, because when I'm hearing this, I think we've kind of covered it enough. We, we kind of, by going through the indicators and stuff, I think we're good to go there. But one thing I will say is that you do get these people or gurus, whether it's online or seminars, um, who might not actually identify as a sovereign citizen. They might not come out and say, I am a sovereign citizen. But what they are saying is sovereign citizen like material or it's based on it. So these indicators should give you a feeling of, hey, maybe this person is a sovereign citizen or has fallen into the traps of it, whether they know it or not. I don't really know what goes through their mind. Um so I guess I want to move on to really briefly. So I don't want to give moral advice, but it is a Catholic family podcast. So I might talk through some Catholic principles based on my understanding. I have, I've, speak, I've spoken to clerics as we all do about things. I have not spoken to one specifically for things I'm going to say in this show. So if you want moral um, like certainty, of course, uh, speak to a, your spiritual advisor. But when we get into this Catholic principles, I think of um, Kevin, I mean, what was the quote? from our Lord that comes to your mind straight away. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, right? Yeah, that's... Yeah. And it's, it's, it's another one that, that I think all, all Catholics, that they kind of try to... No, I shouldn't say all Catholics, sorry. I, I mean, your, your political <laughs> conservatives are kind of like... Uh, because it's, it's, it, it's such a broad statement, you know? I mean, I mean and it's, come, it, it's from God's lips. So, so it's really important to remember that. This is, there's no... Oh, but, you know, uh, and how do we interpret this? Our Lord said, render unto Caesar's, Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That's a pretty broad statement, Matt. And, and that's something that I think, again, in the previous show we had, you have to take that as a broad statement from Christ that says, if Caesar says you pay the tax, you pay the tax. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And a bit more as well, based on my understanding, not might be correct, but I, I'm kind of confident to a pretty good degree, um, that government does have legitimate authority, including non-Catholic governments. Government's not based on and operate on principles that are just not Catholic. And all legitimate authority, rules, law, regulations, whatever you want to call it, needs to be adhered to um, except for a case of if it's actually immoral to comply with something, right? Um, now, one thing I want to make, or, or touch on is <clears throat> based on my understanding is there is something known as a penal law, penal meaning like penalizing. Uh, and this is a law essentially that can be enforced by government, but not complying with it does not in and of itself necessarily constitute a sin. 
Uh, and an example, uh, my understanding is speeding. So if you're speeding, but you're when you're driving, but you're driving safely, uh, it's not recklessly. You're and there's all these other things like maybe you know, do you have enough money in the bank that you would be able to actually like you know I said Australia two hundred twenty dollar fine. Do you have enough money where you'd actually that wouldn't harm your family? So there's prudence. There's all these factors, but if it came down to it. If you're driving past a speed that is safe, that in and of itself is not a sin, um, then you, you, you wouldn't be that wouldn't be a sin. But government has the right to say, "Hey, you drove on our roads, you 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 you, you speeded. Here's the fine." And if that were to happen, you, as a Catholic, you would have to acknowledge that authority, and you would either have to pay that fine or dispute it through legitimate means. And I guess I want to give an example. So I've got a speeding fine somewhat recently and it was like 200 and something dollars. Um, and what it really was, was it wasn't great. I did speed, but it was one of those good old at a yellow light late at night. So an awkward moment, like you're driving and suddenly a yellow light comes on and you're like, oh, I'm dead. and then I decided off, oh, I don't want to run a red light. So I sped up and then pew, speed camera got me there. So I went to I went to Fines Victoria. It's like the police, basically, and of course I, I wrote it up, and uh, you know why I thought it was unfair and asked for a fair review. They said it was justified, and I went, "Oh, cool." The only option you've given me is to go to court. So I went to court because of COVID. I just did it from my home. I didn't even have to go to court. Didn't put a suit on or anything. Nice. Really easy. Um, rocked in. So I went to court on my tablet. Um, I said to the judge, "Hey, have you? You know, he said, what are we doing with this one?'" I said, "Hey, have you read what I sent the police?" Essentially. He read it and said, "Yeah, no, nah, we've yeah, I know the situation, and your criminal record's pretty good, so I'm going to strike out the fine." And I have heard other examples like of people who have actually gotten pretty good outcomes for going to court because they're they're acting in good faith, and um, the government has it. Is it efficient? Probably not. Probably a waste of money, really. But that's what government has chosen in in at least in Australia, and I'm pretty sure in most Western society. So you can use these legitimate means as well. Um, and so, so I got a question for you though, because I've, I've got a, a somewhat similar issue here. In in my German listeners are going to really understand this one. We have something called the the GEZ, so it's it's the radio and television broadcast service. Um, it's yeah. not government run. It is not a tax. That, that's that's really clear, and they make sure that everyone knows that. But you are obliged to pay. I don't know twenty euros a month for this service. I never listen to the radio and I never watch TV and it's not a tax. It is literally a private, a private company issuing a tax to every household in Germany, but it's a private company. So it's, it's a really tough one. And so, so we've gone back and forth and for a while, I, I, I fully admit, I just didn't pay it because I think it is unjust. I think it is not, it's not a lawful tax because it's not the government. It's a private entity that I did not use their service. And that being the case, I decided not to pay it. It stacked up for a while, and then someone knocked on my door. Knock, knock, knock. Here, here's your, um, you know, what, what do they call it? You're, you're, you're being served. You pay this bill with a fine or else. And so eventually, I, I pretty much just had to pay it. And, and I guess eventually, just like, okay, I'm just going to pay the 20 euros a month. But, I mean, what, what's your opinion on the morality of something like that because it's a private company whose service i have not used it's pretty strange yeah look I, like i said i'm not equipped to give my advice if i had to take a stab i would probably say that you probably wouldn't be obliged to pay it and it would be no. to enforce it but as you found they which they did enforce it. <laughs> um, right. and you, you you if you know you could have actually gone to court and said hey the reason i didn't pay it was because I haven't used it, but I know that they are going to, you know, I get it. So can I at least have the fine struck out and I'll pay the bill? It's, that could have been an option potentially. Um, but I would probably say that if you were looking at moral, for me, I guess what would go through my mind is, okay, I tried it, didn't work. They're going to enforce it out of prudence. I'll just pay the stupid thing. Exactly. Um, that's probably the way I would look at it. Because And as for whether they can legitimately enforce it, it's a really good question um, as morally. And I'm really not equipped to answer it. So I mm. guess the way I would look at it is what would I sort of do and as you probably found, it's probably just more prudent to pay the thing and not, you know, you'd, you'd save more money yeah. than if you're um, getting slapped. Which, which I learned. So, so, so yeah. as a moral expert, what do you think? Can I, can I pay the bill 
and in the in the comment section have a have a few curse words um, and, and express my, <laughs> my my real opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not serious. I'm not being serious, but it's been tempting. It's been very tempting. But anyway, okay. I, I guess I, I let's get further on. Um, I guess in the end, yeah. If, if you know, I, if you try it and it doesn't work, and you know you're just gonna pay a fine. Then okay, just pay the bill. Yeah, uh, and I guess what we do is you don't start doing the sovereign citizen stuff. And I, right. um, we'll get into that, but the obvious conclusion with that is that you're just going to keep coming with more and more and more and more debt. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think one... So what else did I have here move on is that... I think we've actually already covered it. I'm, the one thing I will talk about, we've talked about legitimate authority. One thing I, I, I want to speak about, uh, about sovereign citizens and the kind of principles is that um, utilities, other services offered by corporations, if you agree to pay for something, you're... Con- even morally, my understanding is you have to live up to that contract. Sure, you can dispute something like you get a high electricity bill. Hey, I think this is incorrect. Or you get a high water bill. Or you go, hey, this is actually way higher than I expected, but I think we used it. Can we just come to a reasonable agreement and I will figure something out for the future to avoid that? Like you can do, you can alter, like you can alter things of a contract. Like it doesn't mean you just have to be scruples and go, no, I have to pay everything. You can get that corporation to agree to something alternatively. But you can't just go ahead and not pay something that you've agreed to pay for. Uh, and that's actually even, that's like, that's really unfair as well. Um, and I, I don't think we need to expand on that a bit more. But Kevin, on more on the morals, uh, and, sorry, before we move on from the moral stuff onto the legal stuff, which is probably a bit like it's kind of the fun stuff, which you might not talk about as much. Did you have anything I wanted to add or any questions? No, I, I think I think yeah. Morally, the, the easiest line is the one we started with: "Render under Caesar." I mean, that, that's. I, I just don't understand how any Catholic can truly argue for the sovereign citizenship movement or even libertarianism in its truest forms. It just doesn't. It doesn't make sense. Now, if, I, I suppose if you want to create a libertarian government and you want to be part of that, as long as it's morally okay and you're not doing anything, you know, politically evil then sure then then go help form a libertarian government and then you can help run a government that you think will be better and more i, I suppose just and more lenient in their laws etc but while you're under a more social structure yeah you you, you just have to do it there, there, there's no wiggle room here man I, and, and morally yeah. i just don't think I, I don't think it's even a conversation honestly i mean i guess it's a conversation but it, but it, christ is so simply specific like boom that's it that's what you got to do I, I think it's a waste of time. Yeah, and again, a bit sidetracked here, but one thing I sort of think of as well is this whole concept of creating utopia on Earth. That's like anti-Catholic or non-Catholic stuff, right? We don't live for this world, so why the heck are we trying so hard to make everything a paradise? That, isn't that what... I thought that's what Catholics... Who, sorry, I thought that's what people who are not Catholic who are not living for the next life, I thought that's what they do. So I guess that's another thing of um, maybe you're a bit infected, which we all are, by modern non-catholic stuff uh you know materials and all that um we can move on to okay so what i've got here is a section on because i you'll probably always see i'm referring to my notes stops from waffling on more than i usually would uh some relevant legal principles and this is based on my, my understanding i'm not a lawyer like i said but you know i've told what i've looked what i've done based on my understanding of australian law which my understanding is quite similar to pretty much most western law now, firstly, what is common law? Why am I talking about common law? Remember that phrase I said that sovereign citizens will use common law, common law courts. Now, I found a good definition online. Common law is a body of unwritten laws based on legal precedents established by the courts. Now, peel back. I want to say, let's say, for example, there was no legislation, so no act of parliament or bill, I think I call them in America, but nothing that government has put through as law saying murder is a crime. But... If you look at past, let's say, in this ex- fictitious example, which actually I actually, I actually don't think is as fictitious as I'm making, I think that did happen in Australia. It has still, I can't remember. But um, but because of pay, uh, of uh, past cases, past cases have set the precedent that murder is a criminal offence. It's punishable, right? So you could say, judge, in a, in a case, and I haven't practised in a courtroom. I want to make it really clear. But based on my understanding, you could say, they judge there's no legislation that says this guy's guilty, but we know all these past cases that say that 
he's you know murder is a crime and these were like the punishments yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you would say it is a crime based on common law or a common law offense now I want to get into really interesting points. Common law can only really be persuasive. That means if you are doing an argument and you are using common law to, to bolster your argument, persuasive means that it's going to, well, persuade, I guess, persuade the judge or, or be persuasive argument or binding, so to speak. Um, so use persuasive is probably the word I'm still looking for. If legislation in that relevant jurisdiction has not come in, that overrides it. So I'm going to give an example here. Um, let's say that a case was decided in a particular jurisdiction. I know you've got states. I'm just going to say America, federal level, whatever, just for the sake of this illustration. So the whole of America, let's say. Let's say it was a case in 1950, and it was decided that it was not an offence to consume drugs. I'm just going to say that. Now, let's say some legislation in that jurisdiction in America comes in after the fact, and let's say in 1960, and that states, hey, it's now a criminal offence to consume drugs. You can't argue anymore that that common law, that case, excuses you because you've got now this statute that come, has come in after the fact or the statute that's come in saying it is an offence. Um, so if there's, any, if there's ever legislation that's in effect that contradicts past case law, the legislation is going to override it. And there is a lot of legislation. So, and again, not a lawyer here, but a lot of common law getting a bit redundant because there's that much legislation going around there's that many rules and stuff that's and rules by the way just real quick um you know rules are generally given authority from legislation so a legislation might say um this particular government body has the right to make rules around this but they use the term rules because it's not an act of parliament but the act of, this act of parliament has designated authority onto this government body therefore when they do make the rules they still have that authority. So it's still legitimate authority. Uh, and that's why they would be, you know, they're binding in, that, in ways, but they, they might have gone a different, different, um, a different uh, term to, to law legislation. Now, someone might ask, how could case law be relevant at all then? Like if, if legislation is, after legislation is made. Well, you can have a case that's heard that is actually around the a particular legislation or a section of it, right? So let's say this, um, I don't know, let's say there's a, uh, yeah, let's say there's that legislation that comes to saying it's, it's a criminal offence to consume drugs. Well, there might be a first case and then the, you know, the lawyers will be like, but well, what does that mean? <laughs> and then the judge will say um, it means that it's a criminal offence to consume drugs. But of course, there can be some more like back and forth and details and all that stuff. So that's where you can have a case going, okay, what does this, what, what does this legislation mean? How should this legislation or this section be interpreted and applied? So that's where your case law can come in. Now, in what I believe to be quite rare circumstances, and I'm not really well versed in this too much, but if you do have legislation or sections of it that can, let's say, be held to be unconstitutional, um, I believe, you know, like a High Court of Australia, High Court of Australia, I believe, would something you could take to that and try to argue that something is unconstitutional or it should be struck out, and then the High Court can actually say, yeah, yeah, this got, this legislation isn't binding; it, it should be struck out and or changed. I, I'm not sure as to the practical order what the process is but it can happen in rarer circumstances but for the purpose of this show sovereign citizens are saying things that there are laws rules regulations whatever that are unconstitutional or for whatever reason do not apply and we're going to get into this but courts have decided against these sovereign citizens when they've taken their arguments to court and that's the really important point here is that they haven't they don't hold legal weight now I think, Kevin, at the beginning, more towards the beginning of the show, I said common law court. There was something I had. I didn't want to give any spoilers, but there's no such thing as a common law court. Um, so, Kevin, if I say to you, based on what I've discussed, if I say to you common law court, on face value, what are you going to think that means? Poof. I have no idea, honestly, <laughs> that the court of, com of, of common opinion, I suppose. <laughs> I don't really know. Yeah, no, all good. Yeah, because it doesn't exist. Um, my, at least in Australia, it doesn't exist. I don't think, I, no. I don't think it exists in any Western society. Now, when I think of common law court, I think of a court that only looks at common law. That is, looks at only case law. Now, think about the absurdity of this concept for a second. As if governments would allow a court system that people can go to where legislation can just be ignored. Like that is just ridiculous. I, I like, so 
you, and this is one of the things you'll hear maybe on, on videos or seminars that aren't so outrageous sovereign citizen stuff. Like maybe they're not talking about trying to pay out of your electricity bills or they're more talking about just government in general or, you know, speeding fines or whatever. But you have to ask to be tried in a common law court. Well, good luck because, one, I don't even think you can decide where you're tried. Maybe you can ask for some things, but there's, there's just no such thing. So that's I think that's a really interesting point. If anyone can prove me wrong, I'd be interested, but um, no, nah, I'm pretty sure that's the case. Um, so, oh, yeah, before we move on. Well, and, 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 I think, and I think, yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's interesting that, that it seems like a lot of these, they try to get these tricks or like these catchphrases to get like to, they, they think if you say, so, so, for example, if a cop pulls you over for speeding, and, and I, I've seen videos of this, and they're like, you can't, you can't pull me over, you can't find me, I'm a sovereign citizen. I mean, it's like, um, he literally did, and he literally will. I mean, so it's like, I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it's not reality. It's, it's living in a, in a fake world. It's living in a world that doesn't exist. You can dislike it all you want. As you say, you can fight it. You can bring it to court. That's an actual reality. That's something you can do. This whole this whole movement, it, it's it's just a dream. It's a, it's a utopia. It's like it's like just I wish it to be so, and thus it is so. And, and it's and it's and I think that that because it sounds good, it sounds like I'm going to make my own rules, and and if it's unjust, I'm just not going to follow it. It doesn't work, guys. It, it, it's it just doesn't work. It's like it's like if you're a kid. And you know, okay, hey, I can't, I can't take cookies from the jar, and if I do, I'm going to get spanked. And you take a cookie from the jar, and, and you're like, no, mom, nah, I, I am a person, you know, uh, with dignity, and you cannot spank me. Well, tell me, tell me, kids, is that going to work or not? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good analogy. Exactly right. Awesome. Uh, I'll move on to as well. I guess on a bit more in the detail. So this is going to get a bit nerdy. But it's a bit of fun. And I guess it's also good for people who might be saying, hey, Matt, you're saying sovereign citizens are wrong on all this. You're saying their interpretations are incorrect. But what, 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 where, how are you disproving that? So let's get into that detail a little bit, but not too much because people might then fall asleep. So um, what have I got here? So, yeah, relevant legal authority. So we're usually looking at, like, case precedents, so case law. And then legislation, I already discuss, discussed how legislation overrides case law and circumstances. Uh, it has to be for the relevant jurisdiction as a general rule. So if I try to cite American law, but I'm in Australia, it's not really going to be effective, right? Because you've got local governing laws. Um, one thing as well, the Bible is not a form of legal authority. You can't go to court and quote the Bible. Now, and this gets me onto a really important point that uh, isn't really something I've read, but is my own observation is that sovereign citizens, um, and, and I actually see this in people who aren't sovereign citizens, by the way, people of good faith and who are working hard, they don't do the stupid mentality stuff, but I think it's it's really important to understand the distinction here. Like you know, um, sovereign citizens blur the lines between what is moral and what is legal, right? If you're arguing the Bible says this, you're arguing something's morally incorrect. If I'm arguing you can't do this because this law is this, I've got nothing to do with morality. I'm saying what is legal. So they're two very separate worlds, just like we discussed civil, criminal, two very separate worlds, same thing. So you have to choose your battleground. And I guess I want to go through the logical consequence. So let's just say, let's go down the moral. Let's go down the moral path, okay? So if I argue this law is not moral, my question would be is, what are you going to achieve by proving that? Um, if the law is not moral, but it's legal, in the practical order, you still have to abide by it. So let's say you get they tax you too much or they fine you too much. So what? Like you can argue it's immoral. You can say it's immoral till you you're blue in your face. You're not. It's not going to achieve anything. Um, the only difference, I guess, would be if something is indeed like if government says you have to do something, but it is a sin. It is immoral to abide by. Right. You, yeah, that's right. But we're not talking about that. Of right. course, like, we're not talking like about a the, hospital, like a hospital that they say must provide abortions, which I know has been done in the U.S. Obviously, that hospital then they have to close down, right? And, and I think that's happened. You know, they they go to these Catholic hospitals and say, no, nope, state law, you have to provide it, and the the hospitals just have to say, okay, then we can't exist. So that's a good yeah. example. As, as, as example. for a person, for a private individual, it, I think it probably rarely it rarely happens, but it could. 
And if it does, then sure, maybe you got to go to prison or maybe, I don't know, yeah. whatever happens. But but I'd say in most cases, it's, it doesn't happen. And obviously, when it comes to, to taxes and stuff, that, that's a totally, totally different subject. Yeah. Yeah. And, we, and again, people can sometimes get a bit on their high horse and try to sort of, you know, I'm fighting for the right cause. But like, and look, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not making stereotypes. But I guess if I was in a situation, I'd ask myself, why am I doing this? Is this really what God wants me to do? because it is it really or is it just me because it's i kind of want to you know it's appealing for me to feel like um someone can't tell me what to do essentially sovereign citizen movement's basically great uh it, it's got the appeal because government can't tell me what to do um corporations can't also t- uh, can't also bill me for things that i've agreed to but um i wanted to get into a bit of case law and i don't want to get too in the detail but it is important to actually look at a judgment and look at the why now, I'm going to look at first an American one I found. Now, someone who's more pro on this might say, Matt, why did you pick this case? There's actually way more earlier or cases that are kind of like these sovereign citizen cases. Look, I haven't studied US law. I just grabbed one. I found one off the internet. But they do refer to other cases as well. But basically, so it's called Paul v. New York. And I'm going to have a link that Kevin can put in the show plan. Uh, you can read the full thing if you really desire. Um, but essentially, it's an American case holding that sovereign citizens are subject to the laws of the jurisdiction in which they reside. Now, I wanted to talk about what's some of the litigants' arguments, so the sovereign citizens' arguments, and I'm not going to read too much, but I'm going to just read some of the language. So here we go. In the amended complaint, plaintiff alleges, point one, that he is a state citizen not a citizen of the United States as defined within the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Um, We're we're hearing wordiness. We're hearing trying to be legal, but it's not really right. Um, Plaintiff further alleges that the state of New York courts situated in the state of New York are not Article 3 constitutional courts. So then again, we're getting this thing like, oh, it's not constitutional. Um, And we're like, you know, where did you get this from? Um, and fly, finally, and this is this might give you a bit of an idea of the character, plaintiff also alleges that the New York Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, as well as the New York Adult Parole Authority, did not and does not have lawful jurisdiction over him. All right, so that's there's sort of the arguments, right? No, you don't have jurisdiction over me. Judgment, I've just, and this isn't everything, I've really just abridged things, um, but so the judgment, here's an excerpt. It is clear from the plaintiff's amended complaint dot, 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 because I've cut stuff out, that he is an adherent of the sovereign citizens movement, and then they quote another case, because as judgments do quote other cases. Basic, and it says, contrary to plaintiff's contentions, contrary to what the plaintiff's arguing, the plaintiff being the sovereign citizen, contrary to that, sovereign citizens, like all citizens of the United States, are subject to the laws of the jurisdiction in which they reside. And then we go on to the outcome. So it says here, for the reasons set forth above, of course, there were a lot more in the original document, Plaintiff's amended complaint is sua sponte. I guess you don't pronounce it correct, uh, correctly. Um, that must be an American law thing, or I'm just not aware of it too much. But I looked it up, and I think what it means is voluntarily by the court. There's sure there's more context there, but you know I'm not an American lawyer, but I think it's the point across. So the plaintiff's amended complaint is dismissed in its entirety with prejudice. Again, I looked that up for the American context. I think that just means the court is saying you can't reopen this like this is closed forever. Shut up, um, idiot. <laughs> shut up, basically. <laughs> Dismiss it entirely with prejudice as frivolous. All right, so you can read the full thing, um, but this is an example. Sovereignism behavior that has failed in court, and you got to see some of the arguments made and what they said. Now, there's a really interesting one called Meads v. Meads. It's like a, it's something to do with a unfortunate marriage case, um, and it's a Canadian case. I haven't studied Canadian law as well, so I have to, you know, got to be careful with that. But one thing about this one, it's it kind of got from my from memory, and I think it got a bit of news coverage as well because this is a huge judgment which also acts like a thesis. It's like this judge has got this sovereign citizen uh, situation presented to him, and he's gone above and beyond. He's given history of this, history of that, and it's it's extremely long, but it's also very informative if you do want to read it. And I think I've only read like 75 or 80 percent. It's actually just massive. It's actually kind of humorous because he's presented with a case and he just gives a thesis for it. But um, it, it's very interesting. It was a it was a marriage dispute case regarding ongoing spousal and child support payments. In this in this particular case, the judge actually coined the term. I think, or he coined it, or at least 
refer to it. I don't know much about the Canadian history as organized pseudo legal commercial argument litigants. And I've also seen the abbreviated to opcals online, but that's kind of like the sovereign citizen thing. So if you see opcal, opcal, it's most likely the same thing. Just a quick excerpt from this, just, just, just on the judgment. So this guy did the sovereign citizen stuff. And the judge said the arguments, the opca arguments, so the sovereign citizen-like arguments, he has advanced have no effect or meaning in Canadian law. They offer him no rights, no indemnities, and certainly not a pot of gold or silver to call his own. So as you can see, this judge didn't mind doing a bit of, uh, I don't know, artistic license, I guess, uh, in, in, in putting his judgment there. But what he's essentially said, and you can read the full thing, is you, he's raised all this stuff, gives him nothing. Because in Canadian law, it's just meaningless. A final one I'm going to talk about real quick. And this is actually really interesting because um, it's about a property. It's actually in the same suburb of town that Father L. Dracker's uh, mission is, Warburton. So very, very interesting. It's an Australian case, obviously, in which a litigant tried the sov the sovsit tactics to get out of paying a bank loan. So this is a civil one uh, and it failed. So we've, we've looked at versus the government versus your spouse, and now looking at, I guess, versus a corporation. Um, so here's an excerpt. So by way of defence and counterclaim, so defending, I guess, her case, the defendant, this is the soft sit, pleads variously in several paragraphs, several paragraphs to the following effect. There's a heap of points, but I'm just going to sort of go through some of them um, because it gives a great idea of the kind of indication you might hear. So what is this plaintiff alleged, or the defendant? Sorry, not the plaintiff, the defendant alleged. A, the name defendant is not the customer of the bank, and the bank would be a defined term for the, the actual bank. In this case, they, they just how they do it. The loan agreement was not a loan, but rather an exchange for a promissory note. So this is something you're going to see with sovereign citizens. I'll go like, you don't have a valid contract, but you haven't got this because this is actually something else, a promissory note. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about what a promissory note is. I did a bit of research, but then I just didn't, forgot about it because it is a loan. Um the, the defendant alleges that the bank engaged... I really like this one. This is really funny. The bank engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct by falsely representing that the loan agreement was a loan. Now, look, loan agreement would be probably um, already... What's the word? Defined as something, but saying it wasn't a loan. Um, I, there's another one here, but I'll just go on to the next two. Uh, actually, the last one, which I've, I've got here... Point F, the contract is unenforceable because it is grossly unfair, um, which actually can, I think, sometimes be, you could sort of argue it in some ways, but contract... But, but, you, signed, but, they, but you signed the loan, right? Yeah, that's that's the issue, right? Um, but look, that's really getting to legal advice. You could, you could, there are so, you could get out of things, I'm sure, and, and do things properly, but that's what that's they've argued in this case. So, um, but an excerpt from the judgment, I'm going to read here. So the judge says... I'm satisfied that the bank has established this cause of action against the defendant. Accordingly, the bank is entitled to enforce its mortgage and recover possession of the six Croom Street property. Further or alternatively, the bank is entitled to repayment in full of the amount outstanding pursuant to the loan agreement. Uh, and this is really, this gets interesting. I'm also satisfied that none of the defendant's defences and counterclaims as set out in her pleadings and elaborated upon in her affidavits and submissions, so just think of the materials, um, have any real prospects of success. And then it goes on to say, accordingly, the bank's application for summary judgment, just forget it, just, just sort of look at the big picture here, in respect of both its statement of claim and the amended counterclaim will be granted, and this is the most important bit, and the defendant's appeal will be dismissed. So, Kevin, what's your? I've read out these three cases a bit. What 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 do you sort of get from that? Um, I, I get that the the complainants or you know, the, the 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 people trying to bring this stuff to court are living in a different world. It's not reality. I mean, it just no judge ever is going to to say, "Oh, yeah, you're right. You don't have to follow the rules everyone else has to." Yeah, totally. Yeah, because. Because you use you know different language or different words or you call yourself something, now nah, you don't have to follow the law. I mean, it's it's. I mean, I think if you look into it, if you really start to think about what this actually means, it just doesn't make any sense. I, I mean, I mean, I, I see again the attractiveness, and I think we'll talk about that before we end. Why is it attractive? Why do people? Why are people looking through this? Because sure, some governments are authoritarian and are immoral or are questionable i mean i may get kicked off of youtube for saying this but i very much question the election in america you know what a year and a half ago now and i don't know if it was a fair election and i actually i doubt it but and I, 
thankfully I don't live in America right now, but, but if I did, I wouldn't be like, okay, no, he's not my president. So I'm not going to listen to any of the rules he, he enforces. It just doesn't work that way. You, you can, you can try to fight it. I mean, however that's going to be, you can try to change it in the next election, but you can't just say, you know, stomp your foot and say, I don't like it. So I'm not going to do it. it. It's, it's, it's not the real world. And, and I think that's what, that's what it comes to this to me that no judge ever is going to allow something like this or am i wrong i just can't even imagine it what what, what scenario would they be like yeah you're right you're, you're special it's a great question and i would say to the audience find me one if you can find me one where a sovereign citizen has one i would be very interested to see it like extremely interested um, but i don't think they exist now i want to get into kevin i guess a bit of I guess I'm going to get into some objections that I might expect from the audience uh, in response to what I have said. Uh, now, one objection or something, or a comment at least, or a question, something someone might say. Hey, there are times where government bodies do make laws or rules or whatever that are unconstitutional or engage in enforcement activity or maybe a government body makes a rule that is outside their jurisdiction because you do have very clearly defined jurisdiction sometimes for a government body. Now, it is true. This actually can happen. Um, but I would argue it's either rare or it's in the practical order not going to affect you, really. Um, it's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you still have to pay taxes. You still got to pay your driver's license fees, all that stuff. So, yeah, it does happen. But to just apply it to everything, really, you should... I think the assumption should be... Um, the assumption should actually be, especially if you're not legally trained, and even if you are legally trained, but you're not practicing or working, so to speak, in a particular field, which is what I generally do, is to assume that you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, it's actually the safest course. So if you think something's technically unconstitutional or someone's acted outside their jurisdiction, unless you're really practicing that field, um, you probably should act as if they have acted within their jurisdiction because if you actually dug deeper, you might find they have. So I feel like that's the, probably the best way to do it. But, you know, if you're a corporation, you might say, dude, this is not commercially advantageous. We've got lawyers who know this. You're outside of your jurisdiction, da, da, da. That's probably where it's mostly going to become practical, I would, I would imagine. But in the practical order for us, not really. Now, someone might say, um, well, I've heard sovereign citizens speak or people who have said the things you're talking about, Matt, um, and or people speak about this common common law and common law courts and things like that that have been mentioned in this show, and they're very confident. They really look like they know what they're talking about. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is here, be careful because some sovereign citizens can be very violent and there have been cases where they've even killed people. So, like, I remember I was looking at a video and there was this case apparently of a guy and his son who were sovereign citizens and they shot two police officers. Uh, and if you think about it, it makes sense, right? If you're the supreme authority... It, it actually makes logical sense when you take it to the extreme. So the one thing I would say is if you're going to sort of maybe get an argument, just be careful of that because they can no, I'm not saying everyone is. There might be some people who are totally fine. I just really want to point that out there that it is a real concern. Some of these sovereign citizens do get violent. Now, and, and, and in a real quick, I'd like to comment on that real quick yeah. because, because, again, I think that's really fitting in the U.S. I imagine this case you mentioned is probably in America. And it's, again, it's, it's part of this idea of, of say, being part of a militia, and I'm sure you've heard of this too, there are plenty of militias in the U.S., which as an idea I understand because the U.S. Constitution and the founding was based on rebellion. It's based on gun owner ownership and stuff, which I, I, I am generally pro-gun, pro, pro gun, you know, but the idea that you can just form a militia and, and rebel and overthrow a government that you disagree with or shoot cops that you you think are overstepping their 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 authority. I mean, do you really think that's the moral option? Do you really think that they, so so you're literally saying okay, they, these guys are doing the wrong thing. So let's go get our guns and shoot them up. I mean, and it's it's a it's again it's it's not even a question for Catholics. I mean, I mean it's it's clearly immoral and clearly something that shouldn't even be an option. And, and I think that as you say, it's dangerous. I mean, and it's dangerous to be at all politically affiliated. Now, that's something I actually want to have a show about. I'm going to have a show about, I hope, this week or next week, talking about that, about how Catholics should or should not be actively political. And I think it's a really interesting conversation. And I think that I, I think that maybe Catholics should be more actively political. But, oh, man, you got to be really, really careful who you're associating with. Really careful, as you say. Mm, good points. I look forward to listening to that show because I kind of have a – my own personal sort of views, but they're not really formed. I haven't thought deeply. So I look forward to that one. Um, 
Awesome. What what I'll also talk, say is, let's say you are in a safe environment. Like maybe you're an anonymous. You know, like you're you're doing a chat with a sovereign citizen, and you want to be anonymous. Like that might be prudent. Um, what I would say is, yeah, they might sound confident, but ask them or at least question. I don't know if you want to say ask them directly or at least question in your mind of have has the speaker received any formal legal training it's like imagine if you've got some lay theologian i mean lay theologians in general are generally distasteful at least to me but uh it, as in general um the concept of them doing that because you kind of know well hang on clerics go through like six seven years of training and you're just some dude who starts thinking that there are some really good youtube videos i mean i mean you, ten, you watch a couple 10 minute youtube videos and you you know everything about the faith and theology come on man i mean you're, <laughs> there's, so much, there's so much information out there i mean i so many so many of these you know lay theologians oh, have yeah. watched some some really good stuff but uh, anyway yeah <laughs> yeah well it's, it's the kind of concept right i guess i would also ask is well hang on imagine the lay this is even an extreme imagine a lay theologian start saying all these things that literally no well-trained cleric agrees with right find me a lawyer that agrees with these sovereign citizens find me a lawyer that says yeah yeah they've, they've got a legal basis um and another thing I would kind of be asking, again, whether you ask them if you're safe or you just sort of think of yourself, and it, can you find a case in which the sovereign citizen tactics have been successful in court? Potentially, you know, if someone's saying, I want to sell you this, this template, it's like, can you, can you tell me an example where this has been successful? Now, if they say yes, don't just believe them. Uh, make sure to actually find a case citation and find it yourself on the internet. Don't just let them send you a PDF. It could be made up. I've seen made up documents. They're really funny sometimes. But if it, so find it yourself on the internet. Find it on a specific legal resource website like it has the cases. And if you do find something you're not sure, look, I'm happy to. I'm happy for Kevin to put my email address in this um, in, in the show notes. If you want my opinion, I don't know why you would, but let's just say you did. Feel free to email me, and I'd be happy to take a look. Some judgments are a lot easier to read than others, and, and as a general rule, um, it's like I think you, when I was reading out some of those case law excerpts, you could already tell the language is a bit different from the ordinary um, language that we're used to. Um, so at least I could sort of take a look and go, "Hey, look, here's maybe some relevant stuff," and I think this is what they're saying. Up to you. But yeah, find, find me an example. Now, I want to make it clear that it's very possible that some of these people, some of the citizens, do truly believe it. Like, that's possible, but that doesn't mean they are correct. You can be truly misled or you could truly, yeah, misled by yourself, let's say. Now, Kevin, oh, we're getting close to an hour, I think. Would it be okay if we maybe go to an hour and 10 or 20 or do you want me to wrap it up? I think we can go a little long. That's fine. Yeah, uh, cool, cool. I think, we, I, think we, I think we skipped on the rubbishy, like, as in we haven't gone into too much boring detail i think we're into some interesting stuff here so someone who's an my objection handle might say well I've, hey i've heard of examples of these sovereign citizen tactics working so what's the big deal well I'll, I'll make a few points on this one question i would ask is how long have these tactics work right because these tactics can delay the inevitable so you might be able to do all this send your stupid things into your utility providers your government stuff and they might go all right cool well, we'll place a hold on his account or her account. Um, and then what we will do is we make sure we follow our internal process and make sure we're also compliant with laws and all this stuff and make sure that we ourselves as a corporation fulfill our obligations so that uh, when we do, you know, get to whatever we're going to do, however we're going to basically get the money from this guy one way or another, um, you know, we might place things on hold. So it's it can delay things. That doesn't mean it's worked. When there's a hold on something, right? If you're delaying something, your debt's still there. Your debt's not going away. Unless they specifically say we've waived your debt, your debt's probably still there. Companies and, and governments, and just like us as human beings, we don't really like to just let money go. So it's unless they really, and it's, so that's one thing to really think as well. Has someone just delayed the inevitable? Now, another question I would say is, all right, who were the tactics tried on? Like, it is possible that you could try these sovereign citizen tactics, by, which, by the way, have been defined by some people as paper terrorism because they send in, you know, like, things that are really, like, they're also a resource strain. Like, imagine if you're running a small business. Actually, my analogy is a bit similar to that I'm about to get into. So let's say someone uses these soft sick tactics on a business and this business goes, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm just going to waive the debt because it's actually going to commercially save us more money if we just waive it and tell them to buzz off. Now, 
that's might happen. I, I would speculate that's more likely to happen in the case of a private corporation because I think governments are always are not really commercial. They're kind of like, no, you just got to do what you got to do. But uh, I don't think a corporation would do it if there was a lot of money at stake. Um, and I would draw, and even if they did, I would draw this analogy and I would ask a question, right? So if I go into a menu, a, a restaurant, sorry, and I see a menu, right? I see a menu with the prices and I see a burger is like 15 bucks. So I, or, I order that burger, then I eat it in there. And then I say at the end, hey, you don't have the right to charge me for the meal. You don't have this, you know, oh, it wasn't a valid contract, all this stuff. And then let's say that the restaurant owner goes, wow, this guy is actually causing such a scene that it's upsetting my patrons, my other guests. I'm, I'm just going to wear the $15 cost of the burger and tell him you don't need to pay and go away now. <laughs> so, yeah, he's got out of paying the debt, right? But what's the moral consequence here? So for that individual, I'm not trying to moral theology, but my understanding is that at the very least, if I had done that, I've sinned against justice, right? Because really, I should have paid for that. That that restaurant should have got that payment, especially because I knew the prices and I knew what their terms were. So that's one thing. I, and that 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 same. Just because we're talking about a restaurant here, people people tend to think, but that's a restaurant owner. What about these? Oh, have we frozen? Yeah. No. Sorry, Matt. My my camera, my nice camera, just shut off. The the battery ran out. Quicker than it should have. Oh, been. that all oh, good. <laughs> so I'm, I'm back. frozen too on a very <laughs> funny frame. <laughs> Sorry about that. Weird. No, no, no worries, mate. I, I will, um, I will re repeat once you're ready. Uh, am I back? Yes, you're back. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I'll, I'll do you want me to just get back into it. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um. So, I, I wanted to say that uh, people could sometimes look at it oh you know you're 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 talking about a small restaurant owner but it doesn't apply to big corporations well the fact is it actually does um just it, it, the same principle applies whether that corporation does good things or bad things if you have a contract with them or you have agreed to something my understanding is morally and definitely legally but morally you still have to really live up to your contractual obligation right doesn't matter I, 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 my understanding is that it can lessen the gravity of a sin right like if you let's say don't pay someone who's just like a small restaurant owner and has a, you know, cause it's that 15 bucks is probably going to make more of an impact than 15 bucks to a big corporation. So I think it, my understanding is it lessens the gravity, but it's still a sin, right? We're, we're, we're not, we're not, let's keep it being your people where well, we shouldn't be. Um, <clears throat> Kevin, I'm rattling. I, I'm doing my good old rambling. I've got two more things before the conclusion. Did you have anything you wanted to add at this point? No, I, I think, as you say, I mean, I think you're not morally justified to not pay something, some service you've received. I mean, I think that's that's pretty pretty clear. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, what I've got two more proposed objections or potential objections. Okay. Now, one thing is you might say, hey, well, Matt, you can't say, or with Kevin, whatever, I'm just using that. You can't say that we should just do everything government says and everything they throw at us, especially when we have these governments that aren't founded on Catholic principles. Now, like I said a bit earlier, I'm, I'm not trained in moral theology, but I do think it is legitimate to not always do what they, you know, s say to do, or, or at least say what they'll punish, like the speeding fine analogy. Um, or sometimes you might just take consequences, like they might say you do this or you get the consequence, right? Um, but of course, there's always factors to consider here. So you'd always speak to someone, a, a spiritual advisor. Um, and the one thing I want to sort of talk about is, yeah, you don't have to just take it. You can also legitimately dispute things. Um, you might be pleasantly surprised if you're acting in good faith. You might be pleasantly surprised if you dispute something. And like with the speeding fine that I had, people were sort of saying, or, or at least one person was sort of saying, oh, you 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 know, you might want to make sure you've got a backup plan to or to you do your legal research. And I'm like, no, because I'm not going to come in with these legal arguments. I'm literally just going to be like I'm some dude who's just like going. Just can I just have a fair trial? Because I just don't think it's right. Uh, and then and that and that got it. So someone's just being reasonable and acting in good faith can actually be really effective. Funnily enough, people are human and judges are human too. Uh, I'm not going to say every judge is good, and I don't know all this, but there's there's really nothing wrong in just going there and saying, "Hey, I just don't think this is fair, and this is why." Can I have an independent review? We have these systems for it. So we should actually use them and maybe give them a chance. I'm not going to say everything's going to be great. I'm not going to say you're going to have a great outcome. It depends on circumstances. But if you have acted in good faith, you know, it could be it could be a good option. Um, 
uh, the the final thing I guess I wanted to say is what if someone says, so an objection could be, well, we know through Catholic principles and logic that the seat of Peter is vacant and we have no Pope, you know, the current Pope is not Catholic, that organisational structure, they there's no there's no um, authority there. And obviously, you know, you've got the thesis that says there's authority to, or, you know, I think it's power to designate and you've got the total, but whatever, the, the main, they all agree, you know, there's the authority's lost there. So let's just go with that. So why can't we say, say the same about um, our governments? Why can't we say, hey, they've lost it? Now, a trained cleric will probably answer this a lot better than I could, but if I had to take a stab, I would just say, well, the church is protected by the Holy Ghost. It does have infallibility. Um, governments do just don't have this privilege. They just don't have it. So governments can, uh, they can do the wrong thing and still be legitimate governments with legitimate authority. So I don't think you can apply those same principles. Uh, look, um, look, look at the Roman, again, going back to what our Lord said, and that was during the Roman times, and the Romans did some plenty of things right, I mean, obviously, but they also you know, crucified, what, 6,000 people on one day, you know, so, so these are, there's plenty of immorality and bad decisions happening during that time from the exact leadership that, that Christ himself said, you pay taxes to this authority, even though they're, of course, they were in a moral government. I mean, that, that's not even a question. So, so again, I think it's just, it's a, it's, it's totally not the same. And, and, it, and it's, it, to me, it's almost, it's so clear, just taken from the words of Christ himself. And I, and I think that, um, I don't know if you have any more to say on that, but I, th I think it's an interesting place to to kind of wrap it up in the idea of, of why, you know, why are people so interested in this concept, you know, and, and I don't know how many people there are, maybe none of the listeners, I, I don't honestly know, but I'm sure the listeners at least know somebody or they've seen it online. They've seen, oh, sovereign citizenship, that's interesting. And so I guess I'd ask Real, you, before yeah. I give my last comments, yeah, go ahead. What, what, what do you want to oh, say Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. I was just going to say, really good question. Um, and I think there's a few factors. Like I said, I think it's this fact that we are Catholic. We have our principles of governance different. I think with COVID restrictions as well, um, vax mandates, uh, you might be in places with vax mandates, Australia encouraged and all this. Um, and that's that can really, when people get pushed in a corner, I think they can kind of feel a bit threatened and then they can lash out and they can kind of try to find any weapon they can, so to speak. I mean, weapon even in a metaphorical sense, like not literally a gun or something, but just the might look at this stuff. So I think that's why it could potentially be on the rise, you know, and I have heard things like, and I, I haven't looked into it, but, um, so, you know, an example might be someone saying, oh, the Nuremberg Code doesn't allow experimentation or something like this and therefore you can't apply vax mandates and all that. Like, I'm like, but hang on, does the Nuremberg Code, like, I haven't looked into it, but if I had to make an assumption or, you know, my, my gut feeling is that the Nuremberg Code wouldn't really be, again, is that, a, is that a relevant authority within the jurisdiction? So it's kind of like, I think it's sometimes trying to latch on and define something, but I guess what we have to really acknowledge is that you're trying to fight a legal battle when you're trying to find legal principles to support your values in a system that is not founded on your values. So it's probably, it doesn't sound like a recipe for success. I'll give you an example. And this is going to kind of be terrible, but it's the way it is. I remember when I first entered law school and it was like the first module, like it was legal principles and skills. And it was really introductory. And she was telling the story in her lecture that um, there was, uh, oh, I recall the details, right? But um that there was a question on an exam. I think it was the Charter of Human Rights in Australia or something to do with that. And one of the questions was, based on this, is abortion legal? And people, she was saying that people, these fresh people just started law, would write their answers in exams and say, no, it's not, because if you apply this part and this part and this part and this part, it's not. She said, but there's that part at the end that says this charter doesn't apply to basically unborn babies. So... You right could totally read this thing and start misinterpreting it, but because you missed that part at the end, you've totally misinterpreted the whole act. So I think it's a really good example as well, I guess, of just be it's that concept of trying to be a lay lawyer just doesn't really work. And as someone who's trained in in at least the first part of having a law degree, I know that 
I wouldn't take on a lot of things because I just wouldn't be equipped. I think you really have to specialize and be really good. And then speaking with coworkers and people who know what they're talking about, have a lot of experience. It's just, it's just a big thing. So I think, yeah, I think it's the, I think it's the governments. Uh, it's the, the values that they ha- have a values that are against us. I guess it's the argument for lack of a better term, you could say oppression or at least these, this pressure from governments that might get people to get more into this stuff. But I think we just have to realize that, okay, why don't you argue morally or legally? If you argue morally, what's your practical what's your practical consequence? Probably nothing going to achieve. If you're arguing legally, well, you're probably going to lose, right? Because you're 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 probably going to lose because one, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, if you're reading something, you're probably going to misinterpret it. That's just that's just the fact. If you're not trained in it, and even if you are trained in it, if you just read it, you're probably going to misinterpret it. Um, and it's just it's probably just not going to be successful. So that's probably, I guess, my rant at the end of the day. <laughs> well, not rant, but you know, rambling on. No, I think well said, and and I think that that I think. To remember the idea of, of wanting a parallel society and wanting something that is you know, not of this world, the answer is not to try to be a parallel society in terms of in the world. The, the, the alternative is to have your own parallel society in terms of your faith and, and how you live. And remember that the second part of what Christ said, you know, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God that which is God's. That's the parallel society. We, we are bound to this earth in this veil of tears. There's a reason why it's called that. It's, it's not easy. It's not utopia. There will always be government oppression and, and problems. Always. Because men are in charge and men are not God. They make mistakes. They, they, they are sometimes evil. And then they make evil rules, evil laws. Now, again, as we said before, if there is an evil law that you cannot morally you know, obey, say again, a, a hospital that's forced to do abortions, then okay, you got to close the hospital. And, and there are some things you cannot do. Of course, we're, we're not arguing that at all. And that's what you have to decide in terms, you know, in terms of, of COVID stuff too. talk to your priest about that, you know, the, the morality of that, that's not something that we're going to judge here on the show, obviously, I mean, but the idea of trying to form a parallel society it just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And, and, and you're just, you're going to, as Matt said earlier, you're going to stack up debt. You're going to get in trouble with your government. Who knows? You're going to go to prison. And if you got to go to prison, especially if you have a family, is this the answer? You know, it, it's just, it's, it's a fairy tale idea. And what we have to do instead is to create that parallel world through our faith. Our homes can be, you know, the, 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 the quote unquote Benedict option. There, there's, a, I don't know if you know that book. And I actually don't really agree with his outcome. I think that the Benedict option for us, in my opinion, is our homes and our, our parishes and our friends and the, the circle in which we live. That is the, the society and the Benedictine cloister that we need to form because we live in the world and, and that's the reality. And we pay taxes in the world if we like it or not. And that's I think anything I've taken from the show is it's not practical. It just doesn't make sense. And, and at times it can definitely be immoral. And so just pay the taxes, pay the stupid TV and radio bill. And, and if it makes you suffer a little bit, remember that suffering is part of what we're here for. Suffering is what brings us to Christ. Take up our crosses and, and by doing so, that will lead us to heaven. And I think that that's, that's kind of my last thoughts on it. And I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the discussion because, because I, I've seen it for sure online, this, this temptation towards libertarianism and this extreme form of that in, in the in the um, sovereign citizen, so I guess that's my last words. And, and Matt, I think maybe I'll I'll let you wrap it up um, with uh, you kind of did already, but maybe your your last last words <laughs> on the subject. Yeah, well, you know how much I love talking, Kevin. But um, look, that was really well said. I don't really know if I have much to add, but uh, I'll do it anyway because I like the sound of my own voice. But um, now one thing I would probably sort of mention, basically kind of what you said, you, I know you talked a lot about this parallel society and also I wanted to say, but even like the stuff that's not setting that up, but like like you said, just trying to get out of taxes or trying things on like that. Uh, my personal opinion is that it's even not just, it's just not healthy, right? So you're going to... I think a side effect of that, and I'm not a psychologist, I don't do all these disclaimers, but it's really just my observations. You can disagree with me. I don't really care. But in case um, I might be right, this might be an interesting point, um, is that 
I think a side effect of that is it's like a cop out. So you're sort of saying you kind of it's almost like a despair, in my opinion. It's like saying I can't legitimately get through life. I can't find a good job. I can't do all this stuff. Therefore, I'm going to have to try to find to cheat my way out of paying things. And that's how I'm going to live by just not paying things. And that's just going to be so bad. It's just like you're going to get debt, like you said, potentially a criminal record. How are you going to raise a family with it? Look, you're better off just going, all right, well, I don't like gov- what some of the governments do. It's legitimate. But, why- okay, I've got to pay taxes on all this. How about I just, like, make enough that I can get by? I mean, Dan Kramer's, like, I love his shows because he's, like, you know, how basically uh, also that he's talking about, totally separate, but the- he talks about the growth mindset, but it's this concept of work harder and find ways to legitimately live and support yourself and your family. And this soft citizen stuff is, like, the exact opposite of that. Um, where it's to the point of just trying to get out of doing it's like it's almost like trying to discharge duties trying to just get out of doing your duty in any way so i guess that's the kind of final thing i would say is also be careful even if you're sort of dabbling in what you see a few things just be careful of that consequence because you really don't want to get sucked into that uh, and i don't think it's good spiritually um or mentally that i can imagine the effects being good so um i, ho- I hope this show is helpful for everyone as anyone's listened to it um and yeah if anyone has any questions or well, not the question, but just wants to email me or something. Uh, yeah, send me an email if you want to disagree with him. Chuck in the comments. I think I'll read the comments of this show. Perfect. Matt, thank you very much. And, and apologies for my crazy camera. I, I literally just charged it and it said it was 75% or so. I don't know why it went so quick. I, I think it's it's just it's such a good looking perspective that it just it zaps the energy from it. You know, I just Yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think that's it, Kevin. <laughs> I, I, look, I think I'm anticipating that the only comments I'm going to get on this are we preferred it when Matt was not on camera. But, um, you know, <laughs> they, they may say the same about me. They're gonna be like, uh, you know, guys, we really love your shows, but maybe put this one on the podcast form only yeah, yeah. i was no. waiting for the comments you, you both really have faces built for radio <laughs> You know, I, I guess I can't uh, deny it. I can't it. deny it. No, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it, Matt. And, and as always, I hope to have uh, have you on again. I think it's been a I think it's been an informative episode and I hope that it is anyone who's thinking about this. Yeah, idea or movement. I hope this has made you um, yeah, consider um, maybe thinking differently. And if you have questions, definitely um, shoot them over to Matt. Um, if you want to support the show, go ahead over to Patreon and most importantly, like, share and subscribe. Anyone who's just tuning into this show, most shows are not like this, like political or law. Most of them, as you see, if you look at the channel, are they're, they're Lenten meditations, they're conversations with priests. I actually record one today with priests about growing up in the 1990s rather than the 1960s. Kind of the idea of say of a contest and traditional Catholics now we're not in the same situation as our, as our parents and grandparents. And I think it'll be a really interesting show from the perspective of three young priests. And that's kind of the content we tend to, to, to produce. But we also like, again, we like to talk about these things that I, I find interesting. I, I find worthwhile. And, and if I always think if people are going to sit around the table and talk about them or on Twitter or Facebook, I think it's good to have on people who can knowledgeably say, Hey, you know, here's, here's the truth behind this. And I, again, I appreciate Matt, you doing that today because I I'd heard about it. I didn't know much about it. And now I'm much more aware and, and um, yeah, I have, have more in my head for it, for the, for, for shooting people down if they bring it up. So I, I appreciate that. And, and I hope to have you on again and, and until next time, God bless. Thank you, Kevin. God bless. Appreciate it. <laughs>